like to look again this morning and kind of try to pick up where we left off last week, John chapter 21. We're dealing with the address of the Lord Jesus to the Apostle Peter after they had eaten of that which the Lord had prepared there on the seashore. John chapter 21, let's read verses 15 through uh, 17. And then we'll uh, get into our discourse. So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Now, last week, <clears throat> what we dealt with in this uh, passage is the pride of the Apostle Peter back in Matthew chapter 26 and, 50, and verse 33 and also in John chapter 13 and verse 37 when he made the boast that though all men, including my fellow disciples here, should be offended, yet I'll never be offended. And then when he said there in John chapter 13 and verse 37 that he was willing uh, to lay down his life for the Lord Jesus. And he was very vehement, even to the point there that he would contradict the Lord. He would argue with the Lord as to say, you know, I know more about myself than you know more, you know, than you know about me. Which, uh, when it was all said and done, the Apostle Peter learned a very hard but valuable lesson. You know, I, I have said over, over the years, and I suppose that in many cases this is true, that uh, that experience is the best teacher. Now, I say that and follow that with, with this statement. There are a lot of lessons in life you don't need to learn by experience. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, when I look at my children and I look at the children in this church, I, I want to encourage them to listen to mom and dad and grandparents mm -hmm. and, and learn from the lessons they have experienced. And don't experience them for themselves. There are some things you could do without experiencing, okay? Just, you know, I know we don't like the, the phrase, trust me, here, but, but believe me when I say that there are times that we don't want to go through the same school of hard knocks that our parents and grandparents and some of our older friends have gone through. We want, you know, a wise person learns from other people's mistakes. And I, and I pray here this morning that we, through this discourse, and every time we hear the Word of God preached, as we look at the examples uh, that are uh, given to us in Scripture, we might learn from those experiences of God's people and, and others uh, so that we don't imitate the same lesson. Okay, that we would learn, you know, let's not do this or let's learn to do this, you know, whatever the case may be. So Peter was, he would never say he was proud, but he was, he was proud. He was boastful. He, he was, he, he exalted himself above his fellow disciples. And whenever he had gone through Satan's sifter, all right, his self-confidence had been removed. All right, And so we get to this question now that the Lord posed to the Apostle Peter three times. Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And here the first time he asked the question more than these. So he asked, he asked Peter, lovest thou me more than these? Now, I hate doing this, okay, but I'm going to do it for the sake of understanding. When we look at these next three verses, when Jesus asked the question, lovest thou me, the word love there that he uses 
uh, is the Greek word agapio or something like that. You know, I'm not Greek, so I can't speak Greek words. But it's, uh, it's a form of agape, which I can pronounce that. All right. But when Peter replies, when each time he answers, he doesn't reply agapo, all right? He replies phileo, okay? Which uh, some of you know that the word Philadelphia, all right? The name Philadelphia is a, is a derivative of this word phileo, okay? Well, anyway, he responds uh, with phileo, each time he never says agape, and there's and there's a reason I think that Peter uh, responds that way, and I think one of those reasons is because Peter has learned by experience that while I should agape the Lord Jesus, my experience has taught me that when the rubber meets the road, I have failed. I've not loved him like this. Okay, and let me let me try to explain what I what I mean by that. Okay, so let's let's look at these two different words. Now, and let me say this before I get into that. There is nothing wrong with the English language of the King James Bible. Amen. Say amen. amen. Convince me you believe that. Amen. Okay? There is nothing wrong with the English of the King James Bible. Brother Carl and I were talking about something he had heard. Uh, a minister on the radio is very popular uh, <clears throat> among Christian circles. And he was, he was talking about a word, uh, the word inspiration, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and uh, verse 16. And uh, uh, he was talking about how that, that word inspiration, it should not have been used. It should have been translated another word. And then he was picking apart, you know, what they use in the ESV. He was also picking apart what they use in the NIV. And in fact, he was saying the NIV had, you know, was a better translation of the word than what the, the ESV, which is what he used, you know, and then, then cites the KJV, how like it was a terrible, you know, translation. That's all baloney. Amen. Okay? It's baloney. It is absolutely, in my opinion, it is heresy. There's nothing wrong with the, with the English of the King James Bible. You just got to get into the dictionary and learn what the words mean. Don't assume you do know what they mean. Okay? The word love, you get into a dictionary, you begin to realize, hey, there's a different way this word is used. And so the English word there uh, in, this, in these three verses, while it's... The word love, yet the connotation changes depending on, you know, the context. So anyway, be that as it may, I want to, I'm going to differentiate between the two so that you'll understand what I'm talking about when I'm using it. So first of all, agapeo is how Jesus phrases his question. Do you agapeo me more than these? which I believe he's referring to his fellow disciples, do you love me more than they do? Okay? Which again, answers, goes back to Peter's statement, John chapter 13, verse 37, I am willing to lay down my life for thee. Okay? Peter's answer is phileo. Thou knowest I love thee. He's using the word phileo. The word agape, or agapeo, agapeo, by the way, is the verb. Agape is the noun, okay? Agape or agapio is volitional. It's not emotional. Now, it's attended with emotion, but it's not based in emotion. When we're talking about agape love, agape is an act of a person's will toward the benefit of somebody else. In fact, let me, let me uh, hasten to quote here, Vodou Bauckham, uh, Brother Dan and I have, have listened to him quite a bit over the years. Anyway, uh, he, he defines true love, and he's talking about agape or agapeo love. He says, true love is an act of the will accompanied by emo emotion that leads to action on behalf of its object, end quote. So let's, let's see if we understand what he's saying. Again, he says that true love is an act of the will. So it's not just a feeling. 
Perhaps some of you are thinking Boston right at the moment here, and maybe you weren't until I said that. But, you know, anyway, it's right. All right, it's, it's not just a feeling. This is, this is an act of a person's will. All right, and we'll see some examples of that in just a minute, Lord willing. He says it's an act of a will. It's accompanied by emotion. So when you love somebody in this way, it's not just a duty. Oh, I, this is my job. You know, years ago, Rob and I were, were, were talking about this, and I was in, in jest, you know, uh, saying an answer to a question or, you know, something like that. Anyway, uh, the question perhaps might have been something like, uh, do you love me? Well, of course I do. It's my job. There's no emotion there. You know, if, really, if that were true, there's no real emotion there. Okay? But nevertheless, it's accompanied with emotion <coughs> excuse me, that leads to action. Okay? So you've made a decision, and this decision it moves to action on behalf of its object. So I love my wife. And... Uh, I, you know, when I, when I met her the second time, I had determined I'm going to marry Robin. I'm going to marry that girl. All right. I chose to love her. Now I'm sure that there was some phileo, all right, going on here. We'll, again, we'll get to that here, Lord willing, in just a minute. There was some emotion here. There was, you know, there was some, some elements about, about her that I saw that attracted me to her, all right? But then I, you know, I chose to love her in, you know, agape. And I moved on behalf of her. I acted on behalf of her. I love her. And so I've, I've, I've given, you know, of myself for her, okay? Now, in another, um, uh, another source of this, this agapeo, and I, I forgive me, I don't, I don't have it cited here, but he's, the guy says this, he says, biblical agape love is the love of choice, the love of serving, listen to that, the love of serving with humility, the highest kind of love, the noblest kind of devotion, the love of the will, that is intentional, a conscious choice, and not motivated by superficial appearance, emotional attraction, or sentimental relationship. Agape is not based on pleasant emotions or good feelings that might result from a physical attraction or a familial bond. Okay? Now, when I read that, I think of God's love for His people. I mean, when you look at God's people, what we, what we are by nature... I mean, what is there in us that would attract his attention? You see, there, there's, there's nothing in us. There was no action on our part. You know, there's nothing we did that attracted him to us. Okay, y'all understanding here that, you know, God loves you unconditionally. All right, there was no condition you had to meet in order in, in order for him to love you. He loved you in spite of you. He loved me in spite of me, which blows my mind. I mean, I can give you truckloads of reasons why he should not love me. And yet, I trust he loves me anyway. He loves me for Christ's sake. Okay? You want to, you want to know why he loves me? You want to know why he loves you? He loves you for Christ's sake. You say, okay, well, that, that, really, that really helped me there. That's, that explains why. So why did Christ love me? I don't know. It was his good pleasure. Okay? All right, so, so agape, you've heard me say this before, that agape is just not the warm fuzzies. Okay? Now, while I might... We, we might say, okay, there is, there is a feeling, there's an emotion that, that accompanies this, this act of love. That's just a peripheral. That's not the real meat and taters of, of what agape love is. Okay? Now, let's look at phileo. 
This, to me, is pretty interesting. Okay, Phileo, according to Strong's, he cites a, a, a word that it's from, and he says it means to be a friend to. Listen to that. To be a friend to. Okay. Well, let me hold on to that. And then he, in parentheses, fond of an individual or an object. You reckon there's anybody that's fond of objects? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> we really shouldn't be, perhaps. But anyway, be that as it may. That is, have affection for denoting personal attachment as a matter of sentiment or feeling. While, and he cites the, the Strong's number, which is 25, it's, the, it's uh, agape, or agapeo. He says, while agapeo is wider, embracing especially the judgment and the deliberate assent of the will as a matter of principle, duty, and propriety. So he said, in comparing the two, phileo and, and agape, he says, the two thus stand related very much. Uh, well, I'll, I'll skip that. The former being chiefly of the heart and the latter of the head. So there's a heart love and there's a head love. So he says the heart love, all right, is, is of the um, uh, phileo, whereas the head love is the agape. In other words, again, it's an act of the will. Remember? Okay. Then, to get to this word he gets this from, this um, the phileo, to be a friend, it's, it, it's defined this way. It is a friend. He's at, that is, uh, oh, excuse me, properly dear. That is a friend. You're, you ever have somebody that's dear to you? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a friend. Actively fond. That is friendly. Okay, now let me stop there. A few years ago, I preached a series of sermons, I think it was, on what it is to be a friend. In the Proverbs, and I forget the chapter and verse now, but in the Proverbs, there is, there is the, the, uh, the proverb that says that he that hath friends must show himself friendly. All right, so you, you want to be a friend to Jesus. Peter is saying, I'm your friend. But Peter, he hasn't gone all the way yet at this point. He had the opportunity and he bailed out. I shared with you a statement my dad made many years ago when he was talking about, you know, uh, is somebody who said that he was a friend. He said, I'll stick with you through thick and thin. When it gets thick, I'll thin out. You know, that's not really a true friend. A friend, a true friend, he sticks with you through thick and thin. Okay? It doesn't matter what the situation is. He's your friend. He's going to stick with you. All right? He's going to stand by you. All right? So, but when I, when I was doing some research on that, on that verse of Scripture, that phrase must show himself friendly it literally means to be willing to be broken in pieces. And of course, if you're thinking about what you've read in Scripture, it's, it, it, you must go to John chapter 15, where he says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. All right, so... Before we get, you know, we get too much divided on these two words, understand these words are very closely related. Okay? So I go back to my King James translators and I, and I see where they translate both words love. Well, friends, they're so close akin. Let's just, put, let's just translate it love. You understand what I'm saying? They're not that far removed from each other. Okay, so anyway. That, that word, that same word phileo, is used in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 22. Listen very carefully to what Paul says. If any man love not the Lord, Jesus Christ, let him be anathema maranatha. That word love there is phileo. 
We want to say, oh, well, agape is divine love. And phileo is just, you know, just emotional attachment, all that sort of thing. You know, it's not really, well, hey, this word here is used right here in this text. If any man love not the Lord Jesus Christ, if you don't love him in this way, let him be anathema, maranatha. You say, well, what does that mean? Okay, I'm glad you asked. That word anathema is cursed. Maranatha means at the coming of the Lord. Strong words, aren't they? And all that Paul is saying is that if you don't love him, all right, you're not born again. Amen. All right? And that's that's your end. And you're not that's not your end because you don't love him. You're that's your end because you're not one of the elect. Okay? That's your end because you fell in Adam. And death is passed upon all men, and that all men have sinned. Okay? Okay, so anyway, one other tedious um, use or uh, definition here I want to give you. Again, I didn't, I didn't cite where I got this from here, so forgive me. Um, he says the distinction between the two verbs, that is agapeo and phileo, the distinction between the two verbs finds a conspicuous instance in the narrative of John 21, verses 15 through 17. He says the context itself indicates that agapeo in the first two questions suggests the love that values and esteems. And then he cites Revelation chapter 12, verse 11. And then he says it is an unselfish love. And that's the reason I want this. It is an unselfish love. Peter's problem was he thought too much of himself when it come right down for the rubber to meet the road. He was thinking too much about self-preservation rather than being identified with his friend, the Lord Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? Okay. <laughs> for, for a moment of time, Peter was thinking too much about Peter. He loved Peter. And you say, well, no, I don't, I don't love myself. You know, I, I just don't really, I beg to differ. Yeah. Okay, when it's cold, you warm up. When it's hot, you cool down. When you're thirsty, you get something to drink. When you're hungry, you feed yourself. Friends, don't, don't feed me that line. Okay, because you're loving yourself all the time. Peter loved himself more than he loved the Lord Jesus Christ at that moment. And before we get too quick to criticize Peter, let's just start looking at ourselves for just a moment and see just how far we have gone for the Lord Jesus Christ. How quickly have we bailed out on loving the Lord Jesus Christ because the love of self superseded the love for the Lord Jesus Christ. I know this makes us feel real good. All right? But hopefully, hopefully we'll learn from the experience of the Apostle Peter to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. Okay? In every situation. Are we ready to serve? Okay, this, this kind of love, agapeo love, is, is a, a love of service. Again, it's an act. And you're doing it for the benefit of of uh, the object loved. And I trust and pray that, that, that this love that we're talking about, all right, that we, we have this kind of love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Let me give you a couple of examples here. I need to hasten up. One such example we find, <clears throat> well, let's, let's get 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, I'm going to skip a few things here. 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, we read this. He that loveth not knoweth not God. That one hits really hard too. Okay? Especially when you're thinking about what kind of love we're talking about. You know, a love of service. You know, a love of, of the will. An act, you know, for the benefit of somebody else. He that loveth not, loveth not God, for God is love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. Listen carefully what He said. He says, God sent his only begotten son into the world. 
How is it this, he says, earlier in that same verse, manifested his love. In this was manifested the love of God toward us or to us. That God sent his only begotten son. You see, it's an act of the will. God's, God exercised the, the will, you know, his will. Uh, that he, he had freedom of choice, if you will, if you like that phrase. He had the choice and he chose to send his son into the world, into this world, to die so that those whom he loved might be with him. In fact, let me read the, uh, the passage on further. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That we might live. <coughs> Before this was vital, and, I, and what I mean by that, when, before we were born again, we were dead in trespasses and sins. Jesus is coming into the world. The only begotten Son is coming into the world has blessed me with the opportunity, or not the opportunity, but with the blessing of life. I've been quickened, all right? I've been made alive. But not only do I have life in that way, you know, not only do I have I been regenerated by His, by his life-giving Spirit, but also I have the the earnest expectation, I have the hope that one day I'm going to enjoy this life to its fullest. It is, it is greatly restrained here. It depends a lot upon my own behavior in this life. But there's coming a day where all bars are going to be held. You know, they're going to be all removed. I'm going to experience to the fullest. I'm going to inherit, as Paul put it, Eternal life, Amen. which shall know no end. There'll be no interruptions. There'll be no death. You know, have you ever really thought about what the word death means? Again, going back to the, de the you know, dictionary here, let's define our terms. That word death simply means separation. And there are so many different types of separations that occur here in this world. There's the corporal death. There's a, a spiritual death. There's a, a, a death of fellowship and, and so forth. That I mean, you know, the list goes on. But there's going to be no death at all in heaven. Hallelujah. Amen. That's right. God's loved you enough. To send His Son into this world that you might live through Him. That you might not have any death. Woo! Come on, y'all. Here it is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. <laughs> Let me read on here and then I'll get... Get to the, the thought. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. You know, God did not wait for you to love him before he set his love upon you and exhibited that love for you. The fact of the matter is, if he had been waiting for us to do that, we never would have. And hence, Jesus would never have come and never have offered himself at Calvary's cross. The fact of the matter is, he wasn't waiting on you. He was waiting on his own good time. He was waiting on that one particular time that he had purposed before the foundation of the world to send his son into this world to do what he did. So the next time we're going to, we want to uh, Use the excuse, well, I'm not going to do this and that for thus and so because they don't do this and that and thus and so for me. You know what I mean? Yeah. We don't wait for them to act on our behalf. My friends, if you're going to love like God loves, if you're going to agape -o, you know, one another like God loves you, you're going to love others in spite of their warts. Right? And then John says this, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. If this is the way God loves you, then this is the way you ought to love one another. That's what John is saying. 
not hard to understand, is it? Sometimes hard to do because our old nature gets in the way. Okay? And quite frankly, we a lot of times like to live in the old man. You know, we, we entertain too much time with the old man and not enough time with the new, so to speak. Okay, another example. I'm not sure I should do this, but we'll do it anyway. Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 25. The exhortation is given to husbands. Maybe I should skip that. Maybe I should get to the place where it says, wives, love your husbands. Should I? Okay, we'll, we'll just... <laughs> Amen, brother, thank you. All right. But no, we'll stick with husbands, and I'll just skip the wives part. He says in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives. Same word, agapeo. Okay? Love your wives. Well, how am I supposed to do that? He says it. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. How much are you supposed to love your wife? As much as Christ loved the church. How much did Christ love the church? Well, I tell you what. He died for it. He died for the church. Do we, husbands, do we love our wives that much? Let me tell you something, young men, who are not yet married. You better be very wise about who you pick as your soulmate. Amen. You better pick somebody you're willing to die for. I was talking with a brother here just, just recently. This, this one, one brother in the church there, he's uh, already been divorced. They didn't see eye to eye, you know, in religious things. And he finally he got married again. Well, you know what he did? He married somebody that didn't have the same, you know, uh, uh, beliefs that he does. She goes to church with him and she's miserable the whole time. Friends, young men, Young women, be careful who you marry. Amen. Be careful who you marry. And you want to know what it can be like if you marry somebody who is not a believer, a fellow believer? You don't have to look far. There are people who can go through who can tell you just exactly what it's like. Amen. What you stand to lose. I was talking with a young lady one time and she was going to marry somebody that was, uh, he was not even a believer. It wasn't so much that he didn't believe like we believe. He didn't believe anything, you know, about God. And I, and I told her, I said, look, you know, the scripture says to marry in the Lord. You know better. Well, my, 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 uh, my mother, she, she married an unbeliever and now he's in the church. She did that out of ignorance. You know better. Don't tempt God. She's not in the church now. Don't, don't do that. The Lord's got, he, he's told you, you know, what to do. And if you'll just do what he says, you can save yourselves from a whole lot of heartache. Amen. But back to the, back to the point here. I got to hurry up. Husbands, love your wives. Even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for, for it. Okay. We love our wives so much that we're willing to die for her. But let me, let me add this, if you will. I think I'm, I, I've got uh, scripture to back me up. We should also live for her. Amen. I, I'm not talking about preserving my life necessarily, you know, so that, you know, I can, um, well, how should I phrase that? Somebody probably can, can phrase that a little bit better than me. Look here. <clears throat> you know, I think it's in our nature as husbands, as men, that we will absolutely work ourselves to death for the sake of our wives and for our families, right? But if I'm going to do that and I die tomorrow, when I could make some, some adjustments so that I might, Lord willing, live to next year, I hope this is making sense. Yeah. Then I should do that. Yeah. Right? right? I should do that. That's not being selfish. You know, Paul, he made this statement. 
See if I can get it right here in my mind. To depart and to be with Christ is far better. I, I want to go home to glory. I want to be with the Lord Jesus. My, that's my heart's desire. We sang some hymns this morning, you know, that, that has that sentiment. We want to be in glory with the Lord. Whenever He's, whenever, it, you know, it's His will, whenever, you know, His, His time, that I, I want to go. Yet at the same time, Paul says this, yet nevertheless, to remain or to abide is more needful for you. I'm in a strait between two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better, or to remain here for your benefit. Okay? Lord, you decide. I think it's probably the bottom line there in that regard. But nevertheless, let's not be foolish in our, in our service for our wives and for our families. Okay? Let us... Let us spend and be spent. But let us also do that wisely so that we might be of the greatest benefit long term. I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe that y'all can make some sense of what I'm trying to convey here this morning. All right, so, so Peter then, he's, he's asked the question, do you, lovest thou me, agapeo me, more than these? Peter responds, Thou knowest. Great answer. This is a great answer. And it's a great answer because it's so easy for us to deceive ourselves. Peter said, I'll die for you. All right? I mean, I'm sure that he really believed that whenever he made that statement. But whenever it came right down to doing that, or not even die necessarily, but just confessing that he is a disciple of Jesus Christ. I don't know the man. And that, that cut him to the quick. When it was all said and done, he went out and wept bitterly. Oh, would to God that we would save ourselves from some bitter weeping because we make right choices. Amen? But nevertheless, Peter says, Thou knowest. When he says this, he's saying, he's openly confessing, Jesus, thou art God. Thou art the searcher of hearts. If Peter said that to me, he would be, forgive the term, he'd be an idiot. Because I don't know. I can speculate, but I really don't know. And just so we're clear, he says in the 17th verse, Lord, thou knowest all things. He's confessing Jesus is deity. Y'all see that? He's confessing Jesus is deity. And Jesus, you know me better now than I know myself. You've always known me better than I've known myself. Before I argued with you, I don't do that anymore. You know? Peter has, through the school of hard knocks, he has learned the lesson, Jesus knows better than me. He knows me better than me. Lord, thou knowest. Now, I'd love to get into some, some more details about that, but I, let, me, let me get to, get to the point here <coughs> of the lesson. Jesus says, whether we're talking about agapeo love or we're talking about phileo love, if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, are you listening? If you love the Lord Jesus Christ, then you must exhibit that love. This is the way Peter is, call, is called upon especially, not exclusively, but especially. This is how he's called upon to manifest his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Feed my lambs and my sheep. It reminds me of what we read in Matthew chapter 25, I think it is, about verse 31. Well, let's get verse 40 for the sake of time. The, the sheep have been divided from the goats. Sheep are on the right, goats on the left. Jesus, uh, the king, he, he uh, speaks to the ones on the right says, 
When I was sick, you visited me, you know, when I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me, et cetera, et cetera. And they're like, when, when did I do that? And he says this. He says in verse 40, And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least, not to the big shots, but the least. Unto one of the least of these, my brethren, listen to what he says now, ye have done it unto me. Peter, do you love me? Do you really love me? Shannon, do you love me? Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? I pose the question to you today, friends. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? Then show your love by ministering to one another. Here just recently we talked about provoking to love and to good works. I was talking about, you know, our young men, you know, how they, they, they communicate with one another all through the course of the week. Well, let me encourage you to provoke each other to love and good works. Let's encourage to minister to one another. Let's encourage one another to get in our Bibles and read our Bibles. Let us, let us serve the Lord Jesus Christ by serving each other. God commended His love toward us. He put it on exhibition. He made it manifest for all of the elect to see. When Jesus was there on the cross, stretched out there on the cross, as He was pouring out His life's blood on the cross, He was showing all of us, I love you this much. My friends, let us love one another. Don't wait for a good excuse from them to love them. Let's just love each other. Okay? Let us serve one another. And let's not be waiting for somebody to serve me. Okay? Too much of the time we get, we get to thinking about ourselves. Well, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going out to eat worms. <laughs> Right? You know, when you're thinking like that, that's, as Donnie Thurby used to say, that's stinking thinking. That's stinking thinking. And what we ought to be thinking about is how might I love my brother? How might I love my sister? That's the love of God. That's the love of God. May the Lord add his blessing.